Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's presentation, part of our Agilent Cell Analysis Global Conference. My name is Yama Abasi. I'm head of business and application development within Cell Analysis Division of Agilent. Before I introduce our speaker for today, allow me to share a bit about Agilent and our products for cell analysis. Agilent is a trusted leader in life sciences, clinical research, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets, providing laboratories with instruments, services, consumables, applications, and expertise to enable our customers to gain the insights they seek. Agilent Cell Analysis Division, which now includes ACEA, Seahorse, Luxal, and also uh, Biotech, which was uh, recently acquired by Agilent. Agilent's rapidly growing cell analysis portfolio enables deeper, more reliable insight across a variety of cell analysis applications where investigators and drug developers seek to understand complex cellular environments and interactions, including sulfate, fitness, and function. Our comprehensive cell analysis tools are critically important in various investigative fields, such as cancer, inflammation, immunology, immune oncology, and as you'll find out today, parasitology. I am now delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Salasi Dankwa. Dr. Dankwa obtained her PhD in biological sciences and public health at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her doctoral research focused on invasion of er erythrocytes by malaria parasites, uh, the first step in uh, establishment of mal malarial infection. Her studies identified a key pathway that restricts red blood cell invasion by uh, plasmodium nulsi, a malaria par parasite that naturally infects uh, macaques but has uh, caused outbreaks of human infection in Southeast Asia. Her findings help to understand zoonotic infections by uh, P. nulsi. She is um, currently a postdoctoral fellow at Seattle Children's Research Institute Center for Global Infectious Disease Research and a recipient of Amer American Heart Association postdoctoral fellowship. Her work uncovered a potential mechanism by which binding of malaria parasites to blood vessels can disrupt the blood-brain barrier, resulting in brain swelling. Her current work aims to investigate the utility of kinase inhibitors in repairing a leaky blood-brain barrier, as well as elucidating endothelial barrier dysfunction in cerebral malaria. Before I hand it over to Dr. Dankwa, a couple of housekeeping notes. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the talk. And to help us get as many of your questions as possible, we encourage you to type in your questions during the presentation. Also, we will have a lounge session with the speaker uh, at the end of the session and will be also joined by other colleagues from Agilent. Please uh, feel free to join us and ask any additional questions that you may have. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Dankwa. Today, I'm excited to share with you a work on a project that's using kinase inhibitors to better understand endothelial barrier regulation, both in healthy conditions and under disease conditions. And we want to be able to come up with ways to fix endothelial dysfunction in cerebral malaria, but then also in other diseases. A healthy endothelium is essential for good health. Hopefully for all of us today, our endothelium is healthy and is functioning as it should in all of the different vessels in which it is found um, in our body. So this means that it is inhibiting coagulation and allowing the free flow of blood through vessels. It is acting as a semi-permeable membrane to regulate, uh, to properly regulate the exchange of macromolecules between blood and tissue. And the healthy endothelium should also be preventing the inappropriate recruitment of leukocytes. 
Um, and so we, we want our endothelium to be responding appropriately to various stimuli in, in a way that protects our bodies. The endothelium becomes even more important under disease conditions where it has to appropriately respond to various damaging stimuli. And it's not hard to imagine all the things that can go wrong when um, it doesn't function as it should. Um, here are just some examples of um, infectious diseases where endothelial dysfunction is implicated. You have various viral, bacterial, and parasitic infections. And you can appreciate from looking at this list that several of these diseases have significant morbidity and mortality. And not surprisingly, we see that malaria makes the list. Um, it's a parasitic infection that's caused by plasmodium parasites that are transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito. Plasmodium parasites, um, they enter red blood cells and then they grow and replicate inside of red blood cells. And that sets up um, cycles of asexual replication in the bloodstream. Um, in the mature forms of these plasmodium parasites, trophozoites and schizons, as they are called. Um, for plasmodium falciparum, they bind to specific receptors on the endothelial cells. So that's depicted here. You have your parasite infected red blood cells um, and there's binding to the endothelium. And then these are EM images um, also showing parasite infected red blood cells. Now this binding to um, endothelial cells allows plasmodium infected red blood cells to sequester in microvessels and different organs in the body. They can sequester in the brain where they can give rise to cerebral malaria or in the lungs or um, in the kidneys and the guts. There's widespread sequestration in the gut. And so there are lots of opportunities for endothelial dysfunction um, in, in malaria. And this slide is just looking more closely at endothelial dysfunction in cerebral malaria. So there's evidence of um, altered uh, coagulation. You see there's accumulation of fibrin deposits, which is evidence of excessive thrombin signaling. Um, thrombin is an essential clotting factor um, that also triggers pro-inflammatory signaling and brain disruptive signaling. And so you have this state of coagulopathy. Um, there's also evidence of of the endothelium being leaky. You have this hyperpermeable state um, of the endothelium. And then on the right hand side, uh, various histopathological images from fatal cases of cerebral malaria. You can see this vascular leak. We, we can see that from extravasation of um, fibrinogen, which is a serum, serum protein into tissue. Um, there's evidence of fibrin, um, this is thrombin staining. And then down here, you can see a vessel that has lots of plasmodium infected um, red blood cells, all these tiny dots. Um, they show a vessel that's um, engorged with infected red blood cells. So you can very easily appreciate that you get microvascular obstruction um, with severe malaria. The brain is a particularly vulnerable site for endothelial dysfunction. We know that severe brain swelling is strongly associated with death from cerebral malaria. So these are MRI images. Um, on the left, you can see what a normal brain looks like. And then on the right is a brain with severe brain swelling. Um, the brain is constrained by the skull. And so there's, there's nowhere for the um, fluid buildup um, to go and you end up with compression of the brain stem that's shown here by these arrows. And the brain stem is the respiratory center of the brain. And so um, kids stop dying, uh, stop breathing, and that's, that's sadly how they die. Um, so we know that um, MRI images have shown that edema that results from breakdown of the blood brain barrier is implicated in severe brain swelling but we don't fully understand the molecular mechanisms that lead to, um, to brain swelling. And this is hindering our ability to come up with um, adjunctive therapy that can help reverse brain swelling um, and improve survival from cerebral malaria. There are effective drugs that target the parasite, they kill the parasite, but even with these drugs, mortality rate in cerebral malaria is 15 to 20%. And mortality isn't the only big issue with cerebral malaria. Even in survivors, you have um, significant neurological sequelae. There was one study that showed that 
up to 50% of survivors um, had various ne neurodevelopmental impairments um, when assessed at one, one year after recovery from cerebral malaria. So we need, we need adjunctive therapy in addition to the effective antimalaria drugs we have um, because they are not sufficient to prevent death. This is a slide that just drives home the point about malaria mortality. Um, it's a slide that shows death rates um, per 100,000 people. And you can appreciate from this map that Sub-Saharan Africa bears the brunt of malaria mortality. On the right here are numbers from 2018. This is from the World Health Organization Malaria Report. And in 2018, there were as many as 228 million clinical cases of malaria. Um, and then, excuse me, just a little over 400,000 deaths. Um, and like I said, we have, we have effective drugs that kill the parasite, um, but you still have all of this uh, mortality. And so we need new interventions. We need adjunctive therapy, host-targeted therapy that can be given together with parasite um, targeting drugs to decrease the deaths from, from malaria. Um, this is a map for malaria mortality um, in general, but most of the deaths from malaria are from cerebral malaria. And so you can imagine that host-targeted therapeutics um, that, that repair endothelial dysfunction and um, create the state where the endothelium can function as it should um, could potentially decrease um, deaths and improve survival from cerebral malaria, but also from other diseases that share features of endothelial dysfunction. Um, and, you know, like we've shown before, so thrombosis and the state of endothelial dysfunction, you have thrombosis, there's localized or disseminated coagulation, you have leaky barriers and severe cases and disease like sepsis, you have complete organ failure. And so there's this growing appreciation that host targeted therapeutics can be really important in diseases like, like cerebral malaria. And there are various host targeted therapeutics um, classes of therapeutics that one might consider. Um, kinase inhibitors are particularly attractive because while well, there are so many kinases um, in humans, there are more than 500 proteokinases, which are involved in a wide range of cellular processes, including endothelial barrier regulation. We know that there's extensive kinase involvement in, in barrier disruption and barrier restoration. Um, also, kinase inhibitors have historically been a successful class of therapeutics. They are prominently used in, um, in diseases like cancer. And so they could be efficacious, um, just in repairing endothelial dysfunction um, in cerebral malaria, like I mentioned, but then also other um, vascular inflammatory diseases. And there are already some kinase inhibitors that have been shown to have a positive effect on the endothelial barrier. And so these are reports showing efficacy of BCR ABLE kinase inhibitors. Um, first, I should explain BCR ABLE, it's a tyrosine kinase. Um, that's formed during chronic myelogenous, myelogenous leukemia. Um, it's implicated in the pathogenesis of um, CML. And so these kinase inhibitors were developed as um, first-line therapy for patients with CML. But then there have been a number of reports in recent years that have shown efficacy and decreasing of these BCR-able kinase inhibitors in decreasing edema and endothelial barrier dysfunction. So specifically imatinib, and, and bosutinib, and they've been shown to be effective in, in, in vivo in mass, various mass models, and then there's this case report with imatinib. And two of these studies um, shown here showed that imatinib, uh, the, the, the positive effect of imatinib and bosutinib on the on the endothelial barrier can be attributed to these two kinases. For imatinib is ABLE2, and then for bosutinib, it's um, both ABLE2 and MAP4K4. So then we described it as this, you know, one head or two head um, mechanism of action for these two um, kinase inhibitors. And these papers provided evidence to show that 
Um, the positive effect of these two kinase inhibitors on the barrier mediated by these two kinases um, work together to, to inhibit the formation of actin stress fibers, which is associated with barrier disruption. Um, but then they also strengthen focal adhesions. And focal adhesions are these macromolecular complexes um, depicted here in a, this very simple schematic. Um, focal adhesions help to anchor the endothelial cells to the extracellular matrix. Um, so to begin with, for a study, we are like, why don't we just treat um, endothelial cells with bcr able kinase inhibitors and see what they do? Um, and so we use the Excelligence RTCA system um, to monitor integrity um, of monolayers of primary human brain microvascular endothelial cells. It's a mouthful, so I'm just going to be referring to these cells as HBMX throughout the talk. And so we treated HBMX with three bcr able kinase inhibitors, bosutinib, imatinib, um, which I just explained before, and then dasatinib. And we found varying phenotypes um, with these three kinase inhibitors. Bosutinib was barrier protective. You see a barrier strengthening, it enhanced the barrier. You see this acute um, phase of barrier strengthening, which tapers off a bit with bosutinib. And then with dasatinib, um, we see that it's barrier disruptive. Um, imatinib did not seem to do much to the barrier under the conditions tested. And we looked at effects of these kinase inhibitors, both by exelligence assays and also by immunofluorescence microscopy. So this is an image that is showing um, dasatinib treated cells. And these cells were stained um, with DEPI to look at the nuclei, V adherin. It's a molecular marker of endothelial, of adherence junction. So it should circumferentially stain cells um, where the, the monolayer has an entered barrier. And then cells were also stained to look at actin. And you can appreciate that there are lots of intercellular gaps that form between cells um, as indicated by these arrows in endosatinib treated cells. And so that match what we see in exelligence assays. And so this was a surprising result to us. We were expecting that these three bcr able kinase inhibitors would do the same thing. I mean, they were, they were designed against the same target. Um, but here we are seeing these divergent phenotypes. We also wanted to test um, these three bcr able kinase inhibitors against um, HVMEX that were treated with thrombin um, to better mimic disease conditions. And so in this experimental setup, we treat HBMX with thrombin um, in vitro. It's an acute rapid stimu stimulus and it causes significant barrier disruption. So we allow this to progress for some time and then we treat with kinase inhibitors to see if they will alter thrombin-induced barrier disruption. And similar to what we found in the resting conditions, we see that Bosutinib, when added to thrombin treated cells, almost immediately blunts the effect of thrombin. Um, Dasatinib exacerbates thrombin induced barrier disruption, and imatinib does not do a whole lot. Um, it lies on top of uh, thrombin control treated cells. And so from these exelligence assays, we um, estimated the area under the curve. Um, and we also tested um, increasing concentrations of each of these three kinase inhibitors to see how robust these barrier phenotypes were. And we see that um, the sensitive sort of continues to strengthen the barrier in a dose dependent manner. Dasatinib is progressively barrier disruptive. Um, and imatinib, and other conditions, the concentrations tested um, did not seem to, to change. Um, so to better understand these divergent phenotypes of bcr able kinase inhibitors, we turned to um, a published data set. So this is data from Anastasiades et al. from this Nature Biotechnology paper. Um, and in this paper, they looked at the activity profiles of uh, more than 100 kinase inhibitors, 178 to be exact. So they, they assayed these 178 kinase inhibitors and looked at the activity on 300 recombinant human kinases. 
to get different um, profiles for each of these kinase inhibitors. And the kinase inhibitors they tested included bosutinib and matinib and dosatinib. And they found that bosutinib and dosatinib significantly inhibit several different um, kinases. So roughly 60 kinases for bosutinib, um, about 50 for, for dosatinib. Um, and then imatinib was a bit more specific with about five kinases where activity was decreased by um, to, to less than 30%. And so we can see that um, these kinase inhibitors display significant polypharmacology, uh, which is a term that refers to the fact that, okay, so these kinase inhibitors were designed against specific targets, but they um, they hit many different kinases. Um, and here's just a different representation of this polypharmacology, which we observe for bosutinib and dosatinib especially. Um, so this is a heat map that's showing all 300 kinases um, that were assayed in Anastasiades et al. And in this heat map, dark brown is, um, indicates kinases that have been significantly inhibited. So there's very little residual activity of those kinases after treatment with the three kinase inhibitors. And then on the other hand, those greenish blue color indicates kinases whose activity is enhanced. So you have some small sub subset of kinases um, whose activity is enhanced um, with these kinase inhibitors. And what you can appreciate from this heat map is that bosutinib and bosatinib especially inhibit so many different kinases. And what I've highlighted in this heat map are ABL2 and MAP4K4, which were two kinases that were um, thought to be important in, in mediating the effect of bosatinib and bosutinib. Um, this is expanded a bit here. Um, so we can see from, from this data set that um, bosutinib, which is bioprotective, significantly inhibits able to, but so does dosatinib, which is biodisruptive, um, which makes you question um, if able to is really explaining the protective activity of bosutinib. And then down here, we have MAP4K4 that's also inhibited by bosutinib and dosatinib, though with dosatinib, it's inhibited to a lesser degree than bosutinib. But even so, we are looking at this heat map and we see that you know, polypharmacology is probably important of target matter for the effect of these three bcr able kinase inhibitors. So how do we make sense of all of this? Polypharmacology is messy. Um, it makes it hard to to understand how these kinase inhibitors are working. Um, but then in recent years, there have been various computational tools that have developed to, that have been developed to help us make better sense of polypharmacology and to be able to deconstruct complex phenotypes like bioregulation. Um, one such tool is kinase regression, which is what we ended up using for the study. So I'll walk you through how kinase regression works. So it starts with a, a small scale kinase inhibitor screen. So you just screen um, cells of interest with um, 28 kinase inhibitors. The data from this screen is then fed into a machine learning predictive model. Um, so this model is built on data from Anastasiades et al. So what I described before, the activity profiles of 178 kinase inhibitors against 300 kinase targets. And these 178 kinase inhibitors include these kinase inhibitors that you're screening with. So we know ahead of time what your targets are. Um, and then, so the data from the screen um, is used to train this machine learning model. And then this model is able to predict kinases that are important for the phenotype under investigation. Um, it's also able to predict the activity of additional kinase inhibitors, um, which weren't tested in the primary screen. So kinase regression has been described before. It's been used to better understand cell migration, cancer metastasis, it's been applied in the malaria field, looking at um, host regulators of plasmodium infection of a different cell type, not red blood cells, of hepatocytes. 
And so it's, it's a pretty easy to use approach. It can be applied to any cellular phenotype that is um, quantitative and where you can have a range of phenotypes um, we're treating with these kinase inhibitors. And so in the next few slides, I'll explain um, and show the drug screen we did um, using these 28 kinase inhibitors to understand modulation of the endothelial barrier. And so here again, we use this Accelligence, the Accelligence system, um, and we're looking at uh, monitoring barrier integrity um, under first under resting conditions. So um, treating HBMX with the 28 kinase inhibitors and looking over the next two hours to see how the barrier did. And here I'm showing a graph that um, has a subset of kinase inhibitors which we found to be barrier strengthening. So in addition to bosutinib, which is again shown in purple, there were other kinase inhibitors um, that strongly enhanced the barrier. And then shown here in blue is dosatinib, which we saw before was barrier disruptive. We also perform the same screen, but on thrombin-treated cells um, using a similar setup as just described before. So cells are first treated with thrombin to induce barrier disruption, and then we um, follow up with kinase inhibitors to see how they alter thrombin and induce barrier disruption. And here we are, I'm showing the, the same kinase inhibitors that were highlighted under resting conditions. Um, we see that the kinase inhibitors that strengthen the barrier under resting conditions protect against thrombin induced barrier disruption. Either they blunt the effect of thrombin, so you almost immediately see this um, recovery. Either they do that and or they they promote faster recovery of the endothelial barrier. Um, so those green kinase inhibitor, K25A, which is our best barrier strengthening and barrier protective kinase inhibitor, it immediately blunts the effect of thrombin and leads to really fast recovery of the endothelial barrier. On the other hand, you have those brownish, greenish kinase inhibitor that acts a little more slowly, but then eventually leads to faster recovery of the barrier. So it was interesting to us to see, you know, similar phenotypes, similar kinetics of these kinase inhibitors and the resting and thrombin activated um, conditions. We then introduced another, yet another condition. Um, so TNF alpha is an inflammatory cytokine that's increased in um, inflammatory conditions in malaria. Um, it tracks pretty closely with severity. So higher TNF alpha levels in more severe cases of malaria. And so we, we treated the cells with TNF alpha and then um, with thrombin as before and then added kinase inhibitors. And here again, we see very similar phenotypes of these same bioprotective kinase inhibitors. And so to us, this suggested that the way common pathways that were being activated um, by these kinase inhibitors under each of these experimental conditions. And the phenotypes we saw with the barrier protective kinase inhibitors um, are similar to what's been described before for sphingosine 1-phosphate. Um, so on the left is um, sphingosine 1-phosphate um, applied to, I believe this is bovine, lung, microvascular, and the wheel cells. And you see that there's a dose-dependent increase in barrier strengthening. And then on, on the right is um, S1P applied to thrombin treated cells. So very similar setup to, uh, um, to ours, where you first treat with thrombin and then add S1P. And almost immediately you can see this blunting of thrombin-induced barrier disruption and then faster recovery back to baseline. Um, so interestingly, sphingosine 1-phosphate, um, people tried to develop it as a therapeutic and it wasn't successful because there were lots of um, adverse side effects. Um, but perhaps our kin kinase inhibitors might do better um, in vivo. And so in addition to exelligence assays, we also uh, monitored the effect of the kinase inhibitors on HBMX via microscopy. Um, and here I'm showing images taken um, at 15 minutes after the addition of kinase inhibitors to thrombin-treated cells. 
Um, so up here, and again, the cells were stained with similar, with markers that I've described before. So Duppy to stain the nuclear, V coherin, which should have um, peripheral staining of the endothelial cells and an insect monolayer, and then actin. And up here is a control cells um, not treated with thrombin, and then um, this panel highlighted in orange is thrombin treated cells where you see there are lots of intercellular gaps indicated by these arrows. And then in green and blue are two examples of um, bioprotective kinase inhibitors. So K2528 is our strongest bioprotective kinase inhibitor, where at 15 minutes, um, gaps have closed significantly. You see some gaps, but nothing at all like the thrombin alone treated cells. And then PKR inhibitor is also bioprotective, but not to the same extent as K2528. Um, and this decrease in gaps is quantified here on the right. Um, so you see thrombin treated cells in orange significant gaps at 15 minutes, K2528 significant, significant decrease um, in gaps. PKR inhibitor, you also observe a decrease in gaps, though not to the same extent as K2528. And then this brownish, greenish um, kinase inhibitor is a kinase inhibitor that acts with slower kinetics um, compared to K2528 and PKR inhibitor. And then at 90 minutes, we see that while there are still some gaps remaining in thrombin treated cells shown here, um, there are virtually no gaps in K2528 and PKR inhibitor treated cells, as well as a slower acting um, kinase inhibitor. So overall, we see that there's really good concordance between microscopy and excelligence assays and that you know, we've identified kinase inhibitors that are bioprotective in the context of thrombin stimulation. And so here's a summary of all the 28 kinase inhibitors. Um, the bar graph on the right here is looking at the area under the curve. Um, and we've shown, um, highlighted these bioprotective kinase inhibitors as well as the satinib. Um, this is where the BC, excuse me, the BCR able kinase inhibitors fall, desatinib, which is biodisruptive, imatinib, which seems to be barrier neutral under these conditions, and then basutinib, which is protective. And so we can see that, you know, you have kinase inhibitors at both ends of the spectrum, but then you also have a number of kinase inhibitors that don't seem to be doing much to the endothelial barrier. And overall, we see this differential modulation of kinase inhibitors on, on primary HBmax. In addition to the area under the curve, we looked at a different metric to try and get a sense of recovery. Um, and for this metric, which we call 50% recovery cell index, we basically estimate, uh, we, we determine the time point at, at which uh, thrombin treated cells have recovered by 50%. So going from, let's say, negative 0.8 to negative 0.4. Um, and at that time point, we, we um, note the cell index of um, HBmax treated by all the different kinase inhibitors, and that's a 50% recovery cell index. And by this different metric, we see very similar phenotypes. The same kinase inhibitors are very protective, the same ones are very disruptive. Um, there are a couple of differences, for example, to, to facitinib, um, but overall the trend is very similar. Um, and so just comparing um, HBmex treated by the 28 kinase inhibitors and the resting and thrombin activated conditions, really good correlation um, between the two experimental conditions. And then here's a heat map, different representation of that, but then also including uh, TNF alpha um, treated cells. So in this heat map, um, dark brown is is baro-disruptive kinase inhibitors, for example, to satinib, and then up here is baro-protective. Um, so again, um, potentially similar pathways that are being, being activated by um, these kinase inhibitors um, under different conditions. In addition to HBmex, we also looked at primary human umbilical vein endothelial cells, HVEX, and we see, again, very similar phenotypes. So these are the four bioprotective kinase inhibitors um, acting with similar dynamics, similar kinetics in HUVEX as HBmex. Um, so in addition to those four, we looked at, we looked at the whole um, set of 28 kinase inhibitors. And this table just 
summarizes how good of a correlation we see between HBmex and HEVEX. And the resting condition suggests with thrombin alone, sorry, with kinase inhibitors alone, and then kinase inhibitors added to thrombin treated cells. Um, and yeah, the takeaway is really good, really good correlation. And so next, you know, we have data now from these kinase inhibitor screens done under different conditions. We apply that data to the kinase um, regression model, the KIR model. And before I show you what the results um, of the modeling, um, what the results were, um, I want to take a bit of time to explain how the, the KIR predictive model works. So KIR is able to deconvolve um, targets of kinase inhibitors so that you, um, you are able to identify um, kinases that are very important for a specific phenotype. So how does this deconvolution work? Uh, so here's a very simple schematic with two kinase inhibitors and um, three host kinases. Um, so you have kinase inhibitor A and kinase inhibitor B. Kinase inhibitor A is known ahead of time to act on kinases one and two and kinase inhibitor B acts on kinases two and three. But then we've done our screen and we know which of these two kinase inhibitors gives us a phenotype. And we know that kinase inhibitor B gives us a phenotype of interest. So then we can deduce that um, host kinase three is responsible for the phenotype of interest. Now from this very simple um, model with two kinase inhibitors and three host kinases, it's very easy to see what the host kinase is that's implicated in the phenotype of interest. But when you have lots and lots of kinase inhibitors um, and many, many, many human kinases, 300 to be precise, you need a machine learning model to figure this out, um, which is why we use the chi -R predictive model. Um, and this model predicted that 50 kinases are important in endothelial barrier regulation under each of the different conditions we tested. Um, and we are heartened to see that ABLE2 was predicted, which to us was a good validation of the approach. Um, so on the right, um, there were various kinases predicted, which have been shown to be involved in various aspects of barrier regulation. Um, and on the right is just an attempt to assign each of the kinases to the unknown um, known aspects of barrier regulation. So you have contractile mechanisms, which ABLE2 is, um, falls under, and then things like positive regulation of actin stress fibers. And in addition to all these known kinases, the model um, interestingly also predicted as many as 30 kinases that haven't been previously associated with barrier regulation. And this was interesting and exciting to us. Um, and down here, I'm just highlighting different cellular pathways in which these predictor kinases are implicated. So predictor kinases here are in orange, orangish brown. Um, and so you have predictor kinases in RAF pathways, critical kinases that interact with VEK and heroin, which isn't surprising. And in the middle here, um, I'm highlighting predictor kinases and what we call the LIMK1 hub. LIMK1 is a kinase that's known to be involved in regulation of active stress fibers. And you see that there are many different kinases that were predicted um, in this pathway. And then on the right, I'm showing the two negative regulators, CSK and MATK, of SAC family kinases. SAC family kinases play diverse roles in cells, um, but they are also involved in um, in endothelial barrier regulation. They mediate both barrier restorative and barrier disruptive pathways. And so we can see that just from a small screen of 28 kinase inhibitors, we are, we are probing vast signaling networks and um, this kinase regression tool um, allows, us, allows us to do this and helps us make sense of, um, of barrier regulation. Um, so in addition to these predicted kinases, um, one thing that the chi -R model um, allowed us to do was to cluster um, kinase inhibitors by their barrier phenotype, just based on the 50 kinases that were predicted. So just to orient you to what you're seeing here, um, 
each column is one of the 50 predicted kinases and then each row is one of the 28 kinase inhibitors that was used in the screen. Um, and the colors here in the heat map correspond to um, the re percent residual activity. So this is data from Anastasiades et al, which I have referenced before. Then dark brown are kinases whose activity is significantly inhibited. And then in blue, bluish green are kinases whose activity is enhanced by the kinase inhibitors. And we can appreciate from um, this clustering that there are um, the heat map analysis that there are roughly three clusters that form. Um, you have this largely um, barrier strengthening cluster of kinase inhibitors. The second cluster is mostly kinase inhibitors that are barrier disruptive. And then this cluster up here is um, kinase inhibitors that don't fall into either category. And then on the right um, is a heat map um, to summarize the activity of each of the kinase inhibitors. So blue is barrier, kinase inhibitors that are barrier strengthening or barrier protective. And then in brown is kinase inhibitors that are barrier disruptive. Um, and highlighted here in the red dashed line are just kinases that you can just see by eye separate out these two clusters. Um, so cluster three and cluster two. Um, and then on the right here, the BCR able kinase inhibitors, um, even though desatinib or bucetinib is barrier protective, it ends up falling into this barrier disruptive um, cluster. So it's not perfect, um, this analysis. Um, it's not able to separate out desatinib from, from bucetinib. Um, but one thing this, this analysis shows us is that there are additional barrier protective kinase inhibitors that um, seem to have a different mechanism of action from the bcr able kinase inhibitors, just in terms of the kinases that they inhibit or enhance, uh, which is interesting. Um, and just looking again more closely at the three bcr able kinase inhibitors, so bosutinib, desatinib, and imatinib, and the activity on the 50 predicted kinases. Again, we can appreciate the similarities and the differences um, and just how complex um, the activity is in terms of, of kinases that are inhibited or enhanced and how it really cannot be explained by one or two kinases. Um, so just to come back to this idea of um, protective kinase inhibitors having a different mechanism from the sutinib. Um, just looking at the shape of these exogenous traces from the sutinib, we saw early, and you can see here that um, it acts early um, and acutely in terms of strengthening the barrier, and then that barrier strengthening activity tapers off. On the other hand, you have these three other kinase inhibitors, which we've seen before, which have sustained protection. Um, this example, which is slower acting, um, but then induces um, barrier strengthening, barrier enhancing activity, which is sustained. Um, and so with the predicted kinases, um, they were predicted by a model, it's a model, we need to go and test and validate the predictions. Um, and so that's what we did next. So we chose a subset of kinases um, and the approach we took was to deplete the levels of each of these kinases and HBmax. Um, so do knockdowns based on shRNA gene silencing. So we knocked down each of these kinases individually and then um, checked to see how the knockdown HBmax would fare in the context of thrombin, thrombin challenge. And here we can see that um, CSK, so C-terminal SAC kinase, which is one of the two negative regulators of SAC family kinases. When you knock it down, it's very protective in the context of thrombin. There are several other kinases that are barrier disruptive. They exacerbate the thrombin-induced um, barrier disruption. And then a couple of kinases that didn't seem to have any effect um, under the conditions tested. Um, we were very interested in the phenotypes we observed um, in exogenous assays um, between CSK and MATK. So MATK is also known as CTK or CHK. Um, both of these kinases are negative regulators of SAC family kinases, but we see that in these assays, when you knock them down, um, they have 
contrasting phenotypes. They have opposing um, opposing phenotypes. And so we wanted to look at CSK and MATK a bit more closely. So these are exelligence traces that match um, the summary bar graph I showed in the previous slide. And so CSK knockdown cell shown in blue, um, they blunt the effect of the bar disruptive effect of thrombin, whereas MATK knockdown cells in orange exacerbate thrombin induced bar disruption. Um, we also looked at the effect of these knockdown cells by microscopy. And in this top row, uh, scramble control cells, CSK knockdown cells, MIK knockdown cells under resting conditions. And you can already appreciate that there are different um, cellular phenotypes, morphology, which uh, we are still investigating and trying to understand what they mean. Um, but with thrombin challenge, so looking at 40 minutes after the addition of thrombin, you can see um, large significant gaps that appear in MATK knockdown cells. Um, also some gaps in the control cells, though not as bad as MATK knockdown cells. And then in the CSK knockdown cells, there are very few gaps. And so once again, microscopy here um, supports what we see in the exelligence assays. And so with this finding of um, contrasting phenotypes of CSK and MATK knockdown cells, we were curious to see how knocking down these two kinases would affect the protective activity of the kinase inhibitors, which we found um, in the study to be better protective. So then we undertook this set of experiments where um, we knocked down either CSK or, or, or MATK as before, and then treated with the bioprotective kinase inhibitors. So knocking down each of these kinases is going to be perturbing signaling pathways um, that are likely involved in uh, the protective activity of these kinase inhibitors. Um, here I'm showing the examples of, of K252A and PKR inhibitor, what we found when we knocked down CSK and MATK. Um, and I just want to, you to, I want to draw your attention to um, the sustained phase of the activity of these kinase inhibitors. If you consider that the activity can be split into, you have the early phase and the late phase. And so looking at these two kinase inhibitors, we see that knocking down CSK and MATK um, significantly decrease sustained um, protection, or yeah, the protective activity we see from these two kinase inhibitors. Um, so in the later phase of this time course, whereas the early, um, early protection or early bar barrier strengthening does not seem to be affected with CSK and MATK knockdown. So we are still investigating this fear that we want to better understand the protective activity of these kinase inhibitors, as well as protection that's conferred when you knock down one kinase or another. Now I just want to summarize what I've shown in this presentation. Uh, we've seen that kinase inhibitors can either enhance or weaken the endothelial barrier. Um, BCR-ABLE kinase inhibitors have di divergent um, barrier phenotypes. Polypharmacology and off-target matter, they are important um, to the activity of various kinase inhibitors on cells. Um, and then kinase regression, this experimental combined experimental computational approach that we used, it is able to deconvolve complex phenotypes like bioregulation. And then importantly, kinase inhibitors um, improved in vitro bioproperties properties and they are promising candidates um, for post-directed adjunctive therapy for cerebral malaria, but even potentially for other vascular inflammatory conditions. And to end, I need to acknowledge, acknowledge everyone that was involved in this work. So this work was a collaboration between the Smith Lab and the Kaschansky Lab. So that's Joe and Alexis. Um, and I work closely with Molly, who's a technician in the Smith Lab, and then also with Ling, who's a computational biologist and was very involved in the modeling part of the study. And then Lizzie and the Kaschansky Lab also contributed to this work. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dankwa, for that uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, so now uh, um, 
we'll uh, start the question and answer portion of the webinar. If you do have any questions you'd like to ask, please do uh, submit them. And uh, we'll be able to get to a few questions uh, by the end of the hour. And if we don't, we'll make sure that we get back to you and then and, and provide you the, the, the answer to those, uh, to those questions. So um, let's uh, go ahead and get started uh, first, Dr. Dunkwa. So you mentioned the Exelligence uh, technology. Uh, for those in the audience that don't necessarily know Exelligence, can you shed a little light about how uh, this assay works, uh, number one? And number two, what are some of the benefits of using this technology for uh, looking at endothelial barrier function or disruption? Sure. So like you probably saw from the presentation, the Exelligence was central to um, all of the work that we did. We could not have done this work without the Exelligence system. And one thing that was really advantageous about it was being able to set up these screens in 96 well format. And the Exelligence system is it's very easy to use. It's the hardware and software, very user friendly, making it really easy to set up these experiments. We just grow the the endothelial cells and monolayers, the Exelligence is able to track growth. And one really nice feature of the system is that you can um, have the, the, the instrument, you can determine um, what the time interval should be. So you can have a record every hour, every minute, every second if you want. So it allows a lot of user control. Um, and for the sorts of assays we did, being able to see barrier strengthening um, was really important because with barrier disruption, you know, we have the IFA, so it's very easy to see gaps that form between um, cells in the monolayers, but the barrier strengthening would have been harder to see via IFA alone. And so with the Accelerant system, we're able to see subtle changes in barrier strengthening. So the system allowed us to monitor both barrier, barrier strengthening and barrier disruption, and we could see very dynamic changes in the kids over the time course that we set up the experiment. And, you know, you can put your plate in the machine and step away and it does all of the recording for you. And then you come back um, and ex export the data and you're able to analyze it in Excel. So really easy to use and really critical for these sorts of experiments. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. So, in your in vitro experiments, the way your workflow uh, is basically set up is either you treat with a kinase inhibitor and look at strengthening or disruption, or you add thrombin and then add the kinase inhibitors and, 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 and look at the, the phenotype. Um, I guess one of the questions here is that could one, would one be able to actually model endothelial disruption with infected red blood cells in vitro, and could, could the Exelligent system be used uh, for that? Yes, we are extremely interested in those sets of experiments, and we are actually optimizing them in the lab now. Um, so there are various stimuli that can be used. We are testing now with infected red blood cells, so just adding those to monolayers of h mix as we did for thrombin. So instead of thrombin, we would be adding um, infected red blood cells. And the kinetics are different. Um, infected red blood cells act with slower kinetics, so the assays would be um, a lot longer. So it's really nice to have the accelerant so that we can, you know, let the plate go and monitor um, barrier disruption over a period of several hours. But then we are also interested in using um, supernatin that's derived from um, rupture of the mature red blood cells, because that's how the cycles of um, replication happen in vivo. So trying to better simulate what happens in vivo, where you have your inside red blood cells, um, you allow them to rupture, um, they release all sorts of damaging factors and toxins, and then taking that supernatant and adding it to the monolayers of HVMX, which would be a simpler setup, but also um, is mimicking what's happening in vivo. So, so there are various um, infected red blood cell stimuli that we can use, and we are very interested in this because with experiments I presented, we are um, a barrier disruptive stimulus is thrombin, which is important in cerebral malaria, but we don't actually have any parasite stimulus. So we can 
um, set up these experiments with infected red blood cells alone or even in combination with thrombin, which is what we see um, in vivo. Oh, that's fascinating. That would be that's that would be great. Uh, the you know one of one of the observations from the the graphs that you showed me was really this remarkable differences in the kinetics. Not only the fact that some of these kinase inhibitors were you know obviously disruptive and the other ones were uh, kind of strengthening the barrier, but also the differences in the kinetics. Uh, that that you observed. Um, just wondering if uh, some of the kinases that you identified to be involved, for example, the CSK, if you actually looked at the biochemical activity of these kinases uh, at different time points to see if, uh, if there's any correlation with what you're observing with the exogen system. Yes, those are also experiments that we are interested in doing. Um, CSK and MAK negative, negatively regulate the SARC family kinases. And so when you knock them down, you should see um, these SARC family kinases that are active. So there should be different phosphorylation marks um, that change on the SARC family kinases. For example, SARC, um, it's where the, the family gets its name from. So tracking the activity of SARC and looking at specific phosphocytes using phosphospecific antibodies. And then also looking even further downstream at the um, activity of substrates that are regulated by the SFKs um, and seeing if um, how activity of um, SARC family kinases or their substrates track with barrier strengthening or barrier disruption. Um, and we can do various genetic studies, you know, double knock, um, knockdowns of dual kinases to see how they affect bear strengthening and bear protection. Um, so we are, we are interested in probing further beneath, um, looking downstream further beneath these kinases that were predicted to understand what signaling pathways are being affected and how that correlates with bear strengthening or bear protection. Fantastic. Um... I mean, obviously, the focus of your work was sort of on uh, sort of uh, edema and then uh, neuro spe specifically neuro neurological edema. But uh, I guess one of the other questions is whether uh, the 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 this could also be applied to other kind of uh, barriers, um, like like for example, let's say epithelial barrier function, and or, or whether it's known if if it's known that uh, the, basically the, the parasite also may impact those uh, the activity of those barriers as well. Yeah, I think you could use like Celligence for other type of um, barriers. You can certainly, I mean, I, 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 I don't imagine that it'll work any differently with um, epithelial cells or other types of, of monolayers of cells. Um, Parasites, plasmodium parasites bind specifically to endothelial cells. And so for our purposes, we wouldn't be interested in testing epithelial cells. Um, but the system is versatile enough that other cell types would work. Fantastic. Okay. And uh, with that, uh, I think we are coming close to the end of the session here. So our uh, sincere gratitude to the, the, Dr. Dankwa for sharing a really remarkable and fantastic work. Thank you very much. And um, as I mentioned, we do have uh, uh, basically this lounge session after this uh, presentation. If anyone is interested, we will also be chatting in the lounge as well if there are any additional questions. So Dr. Tankoa, I appreciate your time. Thank you for a remarkable presentation. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you.